Um, so uh, he asked me to talk about writing tips for writing a good paper. Um, and this is intended to be pretty interactive. So you guys can jump in, stop me at any time. Um, if you want to unmute yourself and just, you know, interrupt, ask a question, or if you want to use the chat window, I'll try to monitor the chat window as well as I'm going along. Um, I'll probably, t I've got about probably 10, 15 minutes of tips um, and advice. Um, and then, you know, we can open it up if you have any other questions, maybe specifically about TRB papers, um, et cetera. So uh, what you suggested is that I pick a paper of mine uh, and go through it and give you kind of like my advice on how to write it or good tips. So what I'm gonna use is this paper um, that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen that I published in the Transportation Research Journal Part C, which is on emerging technologies. And this is actually, was actually a part of my dissertation. So at Georgia Tech, where I did my PhD, I did a three paper dissertation, which as many of you guys know, you very commonly will do a bunch of papers that you kind of staple together. They have a common theme. Mine looked at the impact of real-time transit information um, on transit ridership. So this study, um, I'm gonna kind of walk you through some of the tips and the strategies I use to write it. And I'm actually gonna, my outline for today's talk follows the typical outline for a research paper. So I'll go through the title, the authors, the abstract, which is the front cover material, and then we'll go through the introduction, the lit review, the method, the results, the areas for improvement, future research, conclusions, acknowledgements, and references. So literally, you can pretty much just cut and paste this outline into your paper to start an outline for your paper. At the very end, I'll also give you just a few tips on writing style overall, as well as one or two suggested reading, um, some books that I found very helpful. Um, some of my grad students already know these books, or at least one of them, but others of you might, might not be familiar with them. All right, so let me get started. We're gonna start at the very beginning. We're gonna start with the title. So um, hopefully you can see my uh, fly-ins here. I've got some just highlights uh, on the title here. The impact of real-time information on bus ridership in New York City. Now, you should actually spend a fair amount of time thinking about your title. For any given paper, I usually come up with somewhere between five to 10 variations on the title. And how I end up choosing the title, which is really important, is first I make sure it's succinct. I make sure it's as few words as possible. Um, and even some journals have word limits on the title. They'll say it can be no more than 15 or 20 words. So, so you need to keep it as short as you can. Any word you can get rid of, get rid of it. But on the same time, same, on the flip side, it needs to be very specific and detailed. It needs to clearly convey what's in the paper. And here is my test, my kind of threshold test. I'll call this my pro tip, my professional tip, since I do this for a living. When I try to think about the specific words to describe my study, the specific words I want in the title, what I do is I think to myself, could I find this paper if I were keyword searching in Google Scholar? If I went to googlescholar.com and I was a different author, you know, I wasn't involved in this research, but I needed to find some research on this topic, would my paper pop up because of the keywords in my title? So that's kind of the, the test that I used. My paper would come up um, on Google Scholar with this title. If it's too vague, you know, if, if it's autonomous vehicles for the future, like that's going to be thousands and thousands of papers. Like that's not going to be specific enough. So you want your paper to come up with a keyword search in Google Scholar. The last thing, and I don't have this on the slide, is some people like to have a catchy title, which is good. I think catchy titles that maybe raise a question or challenge the prior literature are often really um, people remember them, which is great. Um, the catch is just make sure it's not too long and make sure it actually clearly conveys what's in your table, in your paper. All right, so the title, um, next up is the authors. So um, on my paper here, there were three authors. And as you all know, um, the order of the authors in our discipline, as you can see on the slide, it reflects the contribution to the paper. So this is the intellectual, and I like to think of it as the time that you put into this paper. First author should have come up with most of the ideas or contributed the most significantly to the paper and presumably put the most time into the paper. Second author, second most time, second most contribution. 
Um, now, I should note, if some of you have friends who are grad students in other disciplines, this is not the same way that many of, let's say, the um, um, kind of uh, sciences do this. So mathematics, for example, if you, if you read a math paper, they're always alphabetical. So it doesn't matter um, what the contribution is, it's just um, the first letter of your last name. So in our discipline, it is relative contribution. Um, I'll also note, um, so the other key thing is typically the last person on the list in our discipline is usually the person funding the research or the advisor, like the professor who is kind of overseeing it. So you'll notice, for example, of our three authors on my paper, Dr. Carrie Watkins, who's an associate professor at Georgia Tech and was my thesis advisor, she is the last author. She was my advisor, um, and so she ended up in the, in the last space here, which is pretty common. The middle author, um, Dr. Greg McFarland, he was also a PhD student who I worked very closely on with this paper. Um, he helped me with some of the modeling. So I did the bulk of the work, I ran most of the code, but he did some bits of the modeling and, and really helped contribute to make the modeling more rigorous. He's now actually an assistant professor at Brigham and Young, Brigham Young University in uh, Utah. Okay, last note on the authors. So this order, this order, the key tip is to discuss the order at the beginning when you're starting to write the paper. If you wait till the end, let's say the day before the TRB deadline, that is not a good idea because some people will think that they should come in a certain order. You know, they might think that they're first author because they wrote more than half the paper, but maybe they didn't uh, do most of the modeling or come up with any of the ideas. They just did the writing. Um, so depending on how you slice up the work, this could be more difficult to decide. So I strongly encourage you, if you have not, at this point, it's July uh, 6th, you should already talk with all your co-authors on potential papers and say, hey, um, I'm planning to be first, or are you planning to be first? Try to iron out this order now, because if you don't, this is where conflict can arise, and you really don't want that happening the day before you submit your paper. All right, that's it for authors. So let me go on to the abstract. And I'm actually gonna spend a decent amount of time on the abstract because this is one of my pet peeves. So a good paper must have a good abstract. I often will just read the abstracts of papers. You know, I'm looking at lots of papers that cross my desk. I get all these alerts from Google Scholar and different journals about different papers that are relevant to me. Um, and so what I do is I click on them and I read the abstract. If the abstract isn't good, I don't read the rest of the paper, okay? So this, I cannot say that how important a good abstract is. Furthermore, on a lot of journals, if you don't have the full subscription, let's say um, you are a consultant or a practitioner and you don't, your company doesn't pay, like our libraries pays for lots of the journal subscriptions, technical journals. Um, all you can see online is the abstract. So if you're gonna go ahead and pay for something, you really want to make sure it's a good abstract. All right, so how do you write a good abstract? Well, it's actually more simple than you think. And I have a very specific way that I write abstracts. And I'm, I've actually borrowed this from uh, one of my former teachers from Georgia Tech, Dr. Lisa Rosenstein. She um, is uh, a lecturer and she would teach uh, technical writing classes um, in uh, civil engineering and, and other disciplines. So, oops, um, so she gave um, this formula for how to do an abstract. And I'm gonna give you my example and how I followed her formula after. So the kind of key characteristics are that an abstract should be one paragraph in length. You rarely see a two paragraph abstract. It might be two paragraphs if you really have like disjointed stuff, but it sh probably should be one paragraph. It should generally be written in the present tense, except for, for example, the method. Um, now, the rest of your paper is probably going to be mostly in the past tense, but typically you see more in the abstract in present tense. So there could be a mix here. That's where you should be careful. It's usually 250 words or less. You do need to check your specific journal. Some say 150 word limit, some say 500 words, but usually it's about 200 or 250 words. So it's got to be short. Um, usually there's no graphical elements, so there typically is not a graphic. And then there should not be any citations. So this should stand alone. There should be no references that go with the abstract. And what should be in it? 
Well, there should be four things, and that's what the bullets are that just came up, the required content. It absolutely must have these four things. It needs to state what the objective of your research is. So the objective or the aim of your research. It needs to say what the method of your research is. It needs to say what the results of your research were. And it should end, ideally, the fourth thing should be some brief explanation of the significance or the importance of your research. Um, and so I usually start my sentences almost verbatim like this. I have a sentence that usually says, the objective of this paper is dot, dot, dot. The method used was dot, 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 or the method is dot, dot, dot. Um, the results show dot, dot, dot. And then the results suggest or the results indicate the significance of the results, dot, dot, dot. So those are almost verbatim how I write my sentences. And then you'll see there's one last bullet at the bottom there, which is a note, and it says you could start it actually going back to the beginning of the abstract. There could be a fifth kind of general thing in there, which is the very first sentence is often some sort of motivation or problem statement before the objective. Um, it's not required, like if you're short on word count, I would just cut that out. But it's usually nice because you have a problem statement. You say, this is the problem. However, and then you say the objective of this research is to, and you basically end up solving that problem. So that is my very, very specific formula. If you do not write your abstracts this way, I strongly encourage you to just start doing it. Because in our discipline, this formula works very well. And to give you an example, here is the abstract. I'm just going to zoom in on the abstract from my paper. Um, so can you see um, the fly-ins here, how I just highlighted the sentence with the objective of this research is to assess the effect? Does that show up or are you seeing the whole screen? Uh, I see the whole screen, so maybe it would be nicer to... Okay, so I've got to switch windows here. Hold on. Um, Why can I not? Uh, nope. Let me try one more thing. I have a bunch of monitors going on, so I think uh, when I have too many monitors, it gets Zoom gets confused which monitor. So now you should just see um, the the set, one sentence highlighted. Is that showing now? E? Uh, yes. Okay, good. So the objective of this research, literally that's how I start, almost always the second sentence of it. You can see the objective of this research. Then the, the next is the method. So here I have an empirical evaluation is conducted, and then I talk about the panel regression techniques. This example I did not start with the method is, um, or the method used, um, but typically I do. Then I have a summary of my results. And so I have, as you can see here, highlighted a fixed effects model, um, reveals an increase of approximately 118 trips per route per weekday. Notice that there are numerical values here. And that is one of my most important things I would encourage you to do. Most of you are doing data analysis. Most of you are doing empirical analyses. Like there are numbers, there is data. I strongly encourage you to pick the one to or maybe as many as three most important numerical findings and put them in your abstract. I like to think of it as if someone is gonna quote my paper, what is the most important finding? And they should have a number if it's a data-driven paper, which many of you are doing. So I have two different sets of numbers that I highlighted there um, in that section right there. I have two different model results. There was one was 1.7% change, another was 2.3% change. So I highlighted my two most important numerical findings. And then the last is the very end should have kind of the larger significance of your work. So this, I like to end with the sentence like the implications of this research are important for decision makers at blah, blah, blah. Or the implications of this research are blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of a, um, or these results suggest. So that's very prescriptive how I write a good abstract. I encourage you all to write your TRB abstracts in this format. I have had good success writing TRB abstracts with this format. Okay, so I did a little longer on the abstract because that, I must say, is one of my pet peeves. And I don't actually think most people realize how easy it is to write a good abstract once you have the formula, if you will. 
So now I'm gonna go ahead and continue on with the rest of the paper. So let's start with the introduction. I'm gonna get kind of cut off on two pages. So I have like the beginning of the introduction from one page and then the rest of the introduction, um, which continued on the next page. So well, what goes in the introduction? Typically my introductions are about three to four paragraphs. Honestly, if your introduction is more than a page, you probably have too much stuff in there. Like if you're writing your TRB paper and your introduction, it goes, it's single spaced and it goes on to page two, you probably need to take some stuff out of it, okay? Um, and there's no set formula for what's in this introduction, sometimes called background, sometimes called motivation section that starts off your paper. But I typically begin the very first paragraph is typically like a big picture. It's like, what are we talking about? What is the motivation or what is the trend that's happening? And often I'll even use like some sort of high level statistic, maybe a statistic if you're doing a safety paper about nationwide crashes or traffic crashes or nationwide fatalities. Um, so often I'll try to use a big picture statistic if I can. In my case, I kind of started off with how public transportation is really important because it has you know, various benefits. So we generally want to encourage people to use public transportation. And then I have some stuff in the middle, the second and third paragraph that kind of changes um, depending on how you're structuring your introduction. Again, there's, there's not a set formula for kind of how the middle of the introduction goes, but almost always the last paragraph of the introduction has the structure of the paper. So the paragraph at the very bottom that I just highlighted in orange very commonly has almost verbatim this paragraph that goes, this paper proceeds as follows. First, the literature review, second, the method, third, the results, etc. So you almost always see like that, I call it the structure of the paper paragraph to then kind of tee off what comes next. So the reader expects the different sections that are gonna happen. All right, so after the introduction, typically you will see the lit review. Not always, but typically. <coughs> So I often call the lit review the prior research section. Either name is totally fine. Now, depending on how much prior research there is in your specific area, this may be shorter or it may be longer. As you can see here, my prior research section was probably about two pages single spaced for this paper. And it's, people often struggle with how to write a lit review. So I'm going to tell you how I do it. Again, there's no set formula, but this is my tip. So first, I conduct a really thorough search and I read all of the relevant prior references. So I will often find myself downloading 20, 30 papers. And I personally like to print them out, which I know is not environmentally friendly, but I, I often handwrite notes on each of them. And then once I have gone through, I have read 20 to 30 references, um, I typically make some sort of table where I then um, take all my notes and I write a table out that compares, you know, first, what journal were they in? Um, what were the methods they used? What were the key findings? Um, what was the maybe location of the study or any key element that might help me figure out what's important? Now, you don't need to do that. You don't necessarily need to put it in your paper either. I do it just to help me organize my thoughts. I know many of my, my students who work with me, um, I often tell them you have to create a table because I want to see as the advisor, what were the prior references you found? Um, so this really helps me organize my thoughts. And then after that, I decide which references I'm actually going to include in the paper. And I try to figure out well, what should the structure of my lit review be. Very commonly, I have subsections. So you can see my prior research is section two, my lit review is section two of the paper, and I have section 2.1, section 2.2, sometimes I'll have 2.3, and these subsections are different themes or topics from the literature. So the first subsection is about the benefits of real-time information, which is pretty short. I didn't do a big review of that. But the second is about the rider impact, so it's a very specific topic. So I like to organize it typically thematically, but you could organize it other ways. So for example, some people will just write it chronologically, like by year of publication. Um, others will group it based on you know, their findings, what, what they found, uh, positive finding, negative finding, which to some extent is kind of thematic as well. So again, no set um, way to do this, but you need to have some sort of structure. Do not just start talking about one reference, then another, then another randomly. I guarantee if you do that, 
your reviewers will come back to you and say, I encourage you to organize your lit review more. Okay, so that I just highlighted, oh, what I was talking about my section 2.1 and 2.2, those were my two key themes. Now, after this, the other thing that I like to do is I like to identify the most relevant prior reference, okay? Um, and for this paper, it was really, really important. Um, the reason it was really important, and you'll see here, is I dedicated two, almost three full paragraphs to a paper, because there was one paper before me that had a very similar methodology, very similar study. So the basic premise of my study was to do an analysis of bus ridership in New York City to evaluate these real-time information apps. Well, one person, one or two, is two authors, but one paper before me came out a few years before and it studied Chicago and it studied the, the transit impacts on ridership of, this, of similar apps. So of course, like it's very relevant and very closely related. I would almost argue my paper was a direct follow-on of their paper. So I spent actually two full paragraphs talking about their paper and what they identified as the limitations of their or possible um, things that were drawbacks of their paper. Um, and so those drawbacks um, then helped me to then identify the last part of my literature review, which is the gap in the literature. Now, first of all, let me say one more thing. So this prior paper, um, I want, I have my last bullet there is consider it in the journal selection. So guess what journal this prior paper was published in? Also transportation research part C. So there's a bit of a strategy here. There was this one really good paper, it came out in Transportation Research Part C. So I said, well, wait a minute, I'm gonna improve on this paper. I'm also gonna send my paper to Transportation Research Part C because it's like a follow-on. So I was very strategic in sending my follow-on paper, if you will, to the same journal. You might not wanna do a follow-on paper. Let's say you find, I found very similar results and that's part of the reason I wanted to send it to the same journal. Maybe you find something totally different or maybe you, you bash that prior paper. Don't ever bash anyone, but maybe let's say you, you change a lot of things and find really different things. Maybe you wanna send it somewhere else. So, so just consider where was that prior paper published, the most relevant one, is that a good fit for you? Oftentimes it is. All right, and then last, um, I almost always identify the gap in the literature at the end of my prior research section. So. You can see in my last paragraph is this leads to three noteworthy items that could be improved in future research. So these three items are what I would consider the gap in the literature that I'm then going to fill in with my study of New York. All right, so that's the lit review. Are there any questions so far? Because I kind of just uh, feel like I'm lecturing a little bit. If anyone has a question, you know, feel free to just jump in or comment. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't uh, do your lit review this way. Um, so, all right, well, I'll just continue on then to so the method. So we can do qualitative or quantitative research. And I actually do a fair amount of qualitative research, um, but the paper I picked here is quantitative because I think most of you are often using data sets or running um, statistical models and are typically doing quantitative work. So for that reason, I'm focusing on the quantitative piece here. Um, and so what do you include in the method? Well, my method section is pretty long um, and it includes, um, in my case, you can see here, it includes actually four different things, um, but let me just note three of them. First, I actually put background information in my method that's very specific to New York City. It's background about the city and actually motivates my whole, uh, what was a natural experiment. And then I usually describe my data set if I have a quantitative paper in the method section. So typically I talk about my data, where I got it from, and I'll show you, um, I usually even put commonly a table in there with some summary statistics. And then usually the most important thing in my uh, method is all my mathematical equations. So if you have some sort of, let's say, statistical modeling, regression technique, et cetera, which I know many of you do, I strongly encourage you to write out in mathematical notation whatever your equation is. Um, I find it much nicer to read a statistics paper when there are the equations, and those equations really should fall in the method section. So, um, also, I just mentioned, um, I commonly have at least one or two figures or tables in my method section. So, let me just point out, this is straight out of my method. I, I had two images. The first is the figure you see on top, um, and this is figure number two. This was my dependent variable. 
in the um, regression models that I was explaining. So I wanted to explain my data set and just kind of show what my data was. So I made this simple graphic. Um, and let me just point out one or two things about it that I think are common mistakes. So first, notice that this whole picture is in black and white. I printed it out and it was in black and white. So you could use color in your graphics, which is very nice. But I also encourage you to make sure you're assuming the person is also the reader is going to print them out in black and white. So notice how each line is different tick marks. So it's a solid line, a dashed line, a dotted line. So you could use color as well as these different variations. And then the other thing I'll note is there's very minimal ink here. So notice that there's not like a filled in background. There's not all sorts of like um, crazy colors on here. Um, and really one of the reasons for that is I um, uh, read a book um, that I really, really like by an author named Edward Tufte. And so some of you may know it. I've got the book at the end of my slideshow on my references here, but it's a visual display of quantitative information. And Tufte talks about this thing he calls a data ink ratio. And the basic premise is the ink in your figure should primarily be used to display the data, okay? So the total, the ink that is displaying data over, divided by the total ink that would be if you printed your graphic, you know, should be high. Most of, you shouldn't have like a filled in background that's like black. Um, that's not good for printing, et cetera. So um, I'm not gonna go into this concept, but I've got the book for you at the end. I really like it. I encourage you to check it out. And then the other table I just wanna highlight really quick, and I have this similar version in most of my quantitative papers where I have some sort of large data set. So this is a table that just um, describes my data. That's all it does. There's no analysis here. Um, so this table, it's table one, or actually I think it's table two. It has, in my case, it had a description of each of my variables. I used my regression in Word, so that's the second column. I have my unit of analysis, which I like to do if my have all different units. And then very common, I make this table, I put my minimum for each variable I had or each piece of my data set, I have my min, my max, my median, my mean, maybe you have a few other summary statistics, but that really gives your reader just background information about your data. So no analysis, just min, max, meaning the, the summary statistics. So I really like doing that. I encourage you to have a table like that if um, in your quant papers. All right, moving right along, because I've got about maybe five more minutes and then I'm gonna wrap up here. So um, after that, uh, I have the results section and I did not put most of my results section because this is the bulk of the paper. So this is typically the longest section. Um, you can see here table three, this is one of I think three or four tables of models that I have. So this has four models in it. There's a whole bunch more later on. And I spend most of the paper is actually presenting my results. So um, there's no, again, set way to do this, but I will tell you my tip, how I write this section, and I always tell my, my grad students this, is I make the figures and tables with my data, like my results first. Like I get, I run all my models, so all of these um, regression models I made, I pick how many are going in the paper. In this case, I included somewhere around 10 to 12 models out of you know, the couple hundred that I ran. Um, I picked about 10 to 12 um, and put them in about three different tables. That was what my whole results section was structured around. So then I ended up mostly just describing my table. So my writing really just follows the figures and tables that show my results. So that's my typical way to do it. I make my figures, my tables with all my results first, then I go back and write about them. After that, after all my results, so I'm skipping a couple pages of my paper now, um, I sometimes have an entire section devoted for areas of improvement and future research. So in this case, you can see the whole bottom half of this page. You know, we're talking six, seven paragraphs, which is pretty long for um, a future research section. So my kind of general rule of thumb is you don't need to put future research in its own section if it's short. If it's one or two paragraphs, you might dump it into the conclusion section, which is very, very common. But if it's long, you might wanna put it in its own section before you wrap up, before you conclude. Um, and the other thing is, um, I strongly encourage you to go through your work and be very critical of it, to try to identify as many of your weaknesses or areas for improvement as you can and write them out. Just 
state them explicitly, which is what I did here. I went systematically through my data, my method, my findings, what were all the weaknesses or the strange things that came out of it. Because if you acknowledge things, then your viewers are going to say, oh yeah, you're right, that is a weakness, but you really can't do anything about it. If you don't acknowledge things, that's where your reviewer is going to say, hey, you didn't put this data in or you didn't put this whatever model type in, why not? So I encourage you to be as thorough as you can before you submit your TRP paper so your reviewers don't come back at you and give you like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And then last, this is my pro tip here. If you're looking for a good TRB paper idea, hopefully you already have yours by now, but if you need ideas for a paper, what do I do? I go to the future research section of good papers I've read. So right here, I'm gonna highlight this paragraph. Notice it says, an interesting avenue for future research that emerged from the regression models pertains to the impact of bike sharing programs on public transit ridership. We couldn't figure out this impact of bike sharing in our paper. But guess what? Two years later, I worked on that exact same topic. I said, you know, we never really did this bike sharing analysis in the first paper. We should write a whole paper on that. So, um, you know, I use the future research section to think about, oh, I, I could do a follow on paper on this topic. All right, last conclusion. So highlight key findings. Um, again, I like to pick two or three key numerical findings. So not every numerical finding of the paper, not every single variable finding, but maybe your two or three most important numerical findings. I reiterate them again in the conclusion. So that first paragraph right here just highlights what we did in the study and our two most important numerical findings. And then what I usually do in the discussion and conclusion section is I talk about my findings and conclusions within the context of prior research. So notice I have one or two citations in my conclusion section, because I talked about my results in the context of some of the really relevant prior studies. So I, I said, what did I find? What did these prior studies find? To kind of put it in the context. And then last, I like to end with the implications of the research. So in this case, it was just um, one sentence, like the, this research has immediate implications for the trans industry. But that's also because I skipped over a prior section. I actually had an entire section on the revenue implications or the policy implications of this research. So um, I ended with just one sentence on it, but I usually will have maybe a paragraph on the implications, be it policy, planning for practitioners, et cetera. All right, after that, I have my acknowledgments. Don't forget acknowledgments in your TRB paper or any other paper. And this includes who funded it? What was the funding source? You need a grant number. In many cases, ask your advisor, what was the funding source? Is there a grant number I should include? Acknowledge any agencies or organizations you collaborated with, like the DOT. Acknowledge whoever gave you your data. If you got your data, maybe you got your data from the DOT or maybe from a transit agency. And then if someone proofread your paper for, let's say, English or grammar, um, but they're not a co-author because they didn't contribute, let's say, in a substantial way, um, you should acknowledge them here. But when in doubt, my pro tip, add them to the acknowledgements. If you're not sure, you know, just acknowledge them. It's better to acknowledge more than less. And last, with the references here, so there's no set number. But if I look at a paper and see less than 20 to 30 references, I think you probably haven't done your homework. So usually, you know, there's, again, you could have 40 references, you could have 50. Um, but if you don't have at least 20, I'm going to guess you didn't really do a late review. Um, and I would consider making sure you've cited people that you think might be a good reviewer for your paper. So probably less so for TRB, but more so for other journals. Think about who you might want to read your paper, um, because editors often look at your reference list and they say, oh, they cited this person and this professor and this researcher. Okay, we'll put those as the reviewers for the paper. Also consider references from the journal you're submitting to. So you definitely should be looking at the transportation research record and what was published on your topic well, before you send your papers into TRB. Um, very commonly, um, you'll find out if your paper is appropriate for that journal if you're citing a few papers from that journal in your reference list. And last, on the writing style, um, I've already mentioned this, but I really suggest, uh, encourage you to put your key findings in the abstract in the results, and then the conclusions again. So I put my key numerical findings in three places, the abstract, the results, and the conclusions.
My other key things are don't use long winded sentences and big language. Like I stick with short, simple sentences. After years of trying to make big complicated sentences, I realized, wait a minute, let's just write it as simple as possible in short sentences to make it easy to read. And last is proofread and proofread. You should not have English errors or grammar mistakes in your paper. Get someone else to proofread it. If you do not state things clearly, it could obscure your results for the reader um, or could make them doubt that you did your, your research properly. If you can't write the sentences properly to describe them, maybe you made mistakes in your research too. So again, it's better to have a clean and polished paper that's well proofread um, to really kind of clearly get things across. So with that, my suggested readings, um, this is the book I talked about on the left by Tufti about the visual display of quantitative information, how to draw figures, tables, etc. And then for writing style, I strongly encourage you all to um, read this book. It's academic writing for grad students. Um, and, and some of my uh, students are currently reading it now um, with me as well. So with that, um, thanks for inviting me today. And if if you want to ask any questions now, go ahead, or you can send me an email if you have other questions. So um, on behalf of ITE, thank you so much for Dr. Brigwood uh, to give us such great advice. Uh, I wish I had this in, in, my, in my first year. Um, so like, yeah, but now I, I think I got very uh, motivated. Um, so I, I will now pass the opportunity to our members to ask uh, questions that you, you may have. Uh. Can I go first? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brigwood. Uh, that's really helpful. Uh, one question I have is like, how do you structure a discussion section if you include that in your paper? Yeah, so that's a great question. So some papers have a discussion and a conclusion section, so they could be separate. And then others put together a discussion and conclusions. So in this paper that I did, I did not have a separate discussion and conclusions, but that's also because I had um, a section before that was, I called it revenue implications, but it was basically the policy implications of my work. Um, so I had an entire like policy discussion and analysis included in this. Um, so for that reason, I didn't um, have one section I called discussion. Um, but what I, there's no set structure for the discussion. That's probably why you're asking the question. Um, it's really tough. So what I would encourage you to think about is what are the policy implications or what are the planning implications? What are the implications for practitioners? For each of those, those are kind of the key things I put in the discussion. Um, also, what I was mentioning with tying your work directly back to the prior references. So what you found, comparing it with what the prior reference found, sometimes that goes in the discussion section as well. So for example, I found almost the same results um, as this prior study, like very, very consistent results with a very consistent method. Um, but if I hadn't, I probably would have needed to have a whole discussion section about why the one study before me got this result and why I got a different one. So, so really there's no set um, structure for discussion. Um, but the last thing I'll say is very common, you put the discussion in the conclusion. So usually this last section is conclusions and discussions where you kind of take this higher level, bigger picture uh, view with policy implications, with um, impacts, um, that sort of thing. So probably not that helpful because there's no, I don't have a formula for that one. But if you do come up with a formula, I encourage you to let me know because I'd love to, love to learn one. <laughs> Still, that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we are learning from each other. So um, any other questions for Dr. Brickwood from our members? Um, I have one actually. So, so sometimes we are working like we are collaborating with other people uh, on papers and then um, what, what is your preference for how to um, for the organization like for example sometimes some people prefer to put everything on a google doc uh, and then they just you know you know work on the same things uh, at the same time mm -hmm. and then how we prefer that we just uh, take turns like we have like a version one and then we pass along to another person version two uh, what, what is your um, experience on that? Which, which one works better in, in your opinion? Yeah, that's a great question. So my preference is actually the second option you just said. So 
typically as the, if I'm the lead author on a paper, I usually take a pass, a pass. So I draft, I try to draft each of the sections. You know, I may not fill in all the sections. Maybe I know, you know, one of my colleagues is gonna do the lit review in more detail, or maybe one of the colleagues is gonna write that discussion and higher level policy implication section. But I'll at least put some notes and some baseline sentences in each section of my paper. So I get one version of it and I typically use Dropbox as my way of sharing stuff. But I take it and then when I am kind of done, I say, hey, pass off to you. I'm gonna tap, tap you. It's your turn with the paper. Use track changes, which is one of the reasons I really like Microsoft Word because you can very easily see the track changes and you can comment. Now Google Docs is getting so much better with it. When I was doing my PhD, it was just much easier to be in Microsoft Word. And similarly, if you use LaTeX, um, for example, the program, I believe it's called Overleaf, which is the online kind of sharing um, platform for LaTeX, that's also gotten much better to show what the changes were to compare old and new versions. Um, but typically I use a Word document. I have a version that's mine and then I pass it off to the next author. They spend the time with the paper. They edit it through. They add in their sections. If, let's say they were assigned two or three sections to write most of. And then I have them pass it to the next person. So I very much do a tag team. First one person, then the next in sequential order. With the overall responsibility for finishing the paper and every sentence in the paper is on the lead author. So you might write section two, the lit review of my paper. But if I'm the lead author, I'm going to go back at the end. I'm going to proofread everything you wrote, and I'm actually going to cross-check a lot of it. I, I cross-check what goes into my paper to make sure everything is stated factually correct, and that just because my colleague wrote something, I want to make sure, you know, I'm sure they didn't make an error, but maybe they accidentally made a typo. And, um, you know, the word increase, they accidentally wrote decrease because they weren't paying attention. Um, I would check those things. So um, that's kind of uh, the last author, or the first author, the whoever's the lead author should be the last reviewer. Um, read everything in detail again, make sure there's no errors before submitting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sure. Any other questions from our members? I think we can take uh, one more. Um, so an another question I have about literature review is that um, sometimes I, as you said, that we just download like 20, uh, 30 um, papers and then we start reading them. So when, when would you call it, um, how, would you, how would you say that I, I've done enough, that, that I don't need to like dig in more? Because this is like an endless process. Mm -hmm. And it's like sometimes uh, I, I write, my, my personal experience is that I write something and then after a while I feel like, you know, I, I need to rewrite it again. Like I need to look <laughs> more uh, literature. So how would you uh, address that in your, in your writing process? Yeah, so the rule of thumb, this is actually, I should have put this on as a pro tip for how to know you found enough literature. So there's two things here. There's finding the literature and then writing it up. Those are two separate steps, right? But finding the relevant literature, number one, how do you know you've found everything? Well, my test, my threshold test is if I find a good paper that's really relevant, I look at their reference list, okay? And then I pull each of the papers on their reference list and see what looks good. And then I read those papers, or at least their abstract, to see if it's relevant. And then from those second set of papers, I then, um, look at their reference list to see what's relevant. Um, and I, and I ch check their abstracts, maybe read the full paper. If it's relevant still, I pull those papers on the reference list. I do this kind of circular process of pulling the reference list, checking their papers and the good ones, I pull the reference list again until eventually the references from what I'm looking at go all the way back to the beginning. And I've got almost all the same ones from the first paper. And so you're kind of like, oh, I've already read that. I've already read that. I've already read that. Oh yeah, not relevant. So when you get to that circular process of, I've already read all of these in the reference list, or I know they're not relevant because I already checked them, that's when I stop, okay? So that's when I know I found everything. And it's never everything, but it's enough, I think. And then the second piece of that is then once I've found everything, it's writing it up. And that's, I actually think, is the harder place because there's no set rule of thumb for what should go in and what should go, not go in. So 
I typically do two things. So first, I already said, I like to make this table. Anything that I think is relevant, I put in a table to figure out like, you know, what was their finding? Okay, was there, or their method? Is either that really relevant to my paper? If so, I put it in, if not, I discard it. And so I systematically go one by one by one in a table, really just breaking it down to the basics. Um, but then the other thing, the last thing I like to think about, like, should it go in or not? Uh, kind of good test is, could this person be reviewing my paper? Like, if this person, you know, wrote a really relevant paper, it, and it might have a different method or a different, you know, finding or, you know, a different structure, but if they know a lot about the topic, mm, they might be asked to review my paper. So I probably should cite them. Maybe not in the lit review. Maybe I use it in the introduction as motivation. Um, but that's kind of another kind of good threshold test, like, or test that I would use. Could this person, do they know a lot about the topic? Could they be asked to review my paper? So um, those are kind of the key things that I do to do my lit review. Sure. And uh, my, my final question, um, and I think this can uh, represent some of us uh, in the group, is that given that we have about like 25 days uh, left, so speaking from your experience as a supervisor, yeah. what would you uh, recommend the students to, you know, stay focused? Yeah, so my advice to you is you should have a draft, a full draft of your TRB paper in the next one to two weeks, okay? Do not, do not wait until the last week to write your paper. Let's say you're still running some models now, start writing, start writing. You really should have, you know, that introduction section is not going to change much, even if you're still working on models. That late review section is probably should already be done. You should have already written your late review at this point. Um, you know, your method, you should have your method and maybe the results you still might be changing and your conclusions, you're probably going to be changing as well, maybe up until the end. But at this point, you should have 60, 70% of the text of your TRB paper written or hopefully have it written in the next week or two. I would tell a lot of my students and some of them know I want drafts of your TRB papers in the next one to two weeks. I want your draft by the middle of July so that I can review it because I do very heavy edits, send it back. The student revises it, sends it back to me, I read it again. Then we usually send it out to another co-author or multiple co-authors. So you need to factor in time for each of your co-authors to read your paper. And again, this is where it's much better if it's done sequentially. So let's say Abu Bakr, who I see is on the line, um, he is gonna send one of his papers to me, and then I'm gonna maybe send it off to our collaborator at CARTA, which is a transit agency in Chattanooga. So we do it sequentially, hopefully, so that if one person's making changes, you know, it's nine, two different versions sort of thing. Um, so you should really aim for at least a draft in the next week or two. Now, it's not to say you might make a lot of changes between now and the final version, but the sooner you get a draft going and can show your co-authors and particularly your advisor, the better. Try not to write most of your paper on July 31st or even worse, August 1st. Like, do not do that. I know people will and it's always a thing, but I really discourage you from doing that. And with that, I'll just say there used to be rumors and I, this never happened to me. But years ago, when I was a student, there were rumors that occasionally the TRB website would just crash on August 1st because so many people were trying to submit their paper and upload it at the same time and it would take, you know, half an hour to upload or an hour to upload. I never had that actually happen to me, but it's a kind of a word to the wise, like if there's hundreds of people all trying to upload to a system at the same time, and hopefully it's designed to meet that now because um, they've got the system down pretty well, but just in case, you don't wanna be the one person who's trying to submit an hour before it's no longer midnight anywhere and the system crashes, right? So um, start your paper, start your writing now, and hopefully you won't come up to the last minute.